Hello and welcome to Psych Sessions, conversations about teaching and stuff. I'm Garth Neufeld along with Eric Landrum, your podcast hosts. As the name implies, we center on conversations about teaching, but we often veer into other interesting topics, which is the and stuff. This is episode 115, where Eric had the opportunity to interview Scott Vanderstoop, Dean of Social Sciences and Professor of Psychology at Hope College in Holland, Michigan. But before we get to that, if you have not yet had a chance to rate Psych Sessions on iTunes, we invite you to leave a rating there as this helps us pop up as people are searching and will help Psych Sessions get out to more teachers of psychology. Also, please check out a new series from Psych Sessions, Writing for Psych, featuring Jane Hallinan, where we pull back the curtain on scholarly and creative writing, where we discuss revising, taking feedback, student writing, and more. Please check out all of our Psych Sessions programming, including Ask Psych Sessions with Marianne Lloyd, Soto Psych Sessions with Anna Ropp, and the second season of Garth and Sue Talk, which was released recently, where we discuss all kinds of things related to teaching specifically. Thanks! At Macmillan Learning Psychology, content matters. And that goes for media content as well, like the extraordinary video collection they've put together for their introductory, developmental, and abnormal psychology textbooks. Classic clips, popular footage, stunning original content, it's all there in one convenient resource where everything is assignable. Whether your students are in person or online, these videos can add something special to lectures and assignments. So when you consider one of their titles, be sure to take a look. Macmillan Learning Psychology, because content matters most when teachers have what they need. Please go to macmillanlearning.com backslash psych sessions for a free content preview exclusively for psych sessions listeners. Now, before you hear the interview with Scott Vanderstoop, please allow me to share some listening tips and some of my favorite moments. So Scott Vanderstoop is a dean at Hope College, and this is what they first get into about what it's like to be a dean, to be an administrator. I think Scott has a very interesting take on this where others might think about this as just the duty that you have to perform every once in a while when it's your turn, something like doing your time. He doesn't see it that way. Eric brings in a conversation about the skills, specific skills that you need to be a good dean and one of the things that Eric talks about is that good deans have to embrace conflict in his experience. And so that leads to a very interesting conversation. Now, you know, they start off talking about that, but really this becomes just a really enjoyable storytelling hour. I don't know how else to say it. This is one of those unique conversations to people who are extremely comfortable with each other, who have been friends for a long time. And we get to sit in on some reminiscing and some great, great storytelling. Scott is a, is actually an amazing storyteller. As I was listening to this, I was just thinking about how nice it would be to be in his class if I was a, an undergraduate. I'm not sure how much he's teaching right now with uh, everything that he's doing as a dean of social sciences there at Hope College. But I would have really enjoyed it. I love a good story. That's for sure. How about this one? Scott and Eric met for the first time in aisle 13 of a Toys R Us. I don't know if it was aisle 13, but you know, Toys R Us, where all great psychologists meet each other and create lifelong friendships. That was pretty cool to hear. And 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 so they discussed that. Uh, Scott's obviously got a great memory for that and and for many other things. The, the stories are great. These two have this report together through uh, MPA, through some things they've worked on together, through Psychi. This all comes up through Bill McKeechee, which I'll talk about in a minute. I actually heard this happening, and then Eric makes light of it in the interview. The, the podcast host role got reversed at some point, you know, pretty early on into this interview. And that led down this rabbit hole, which was 
awesome where we learn that Scott has had a uh, a second career, well, an early career anyway, doing radio and a little bit of television and gosh, that is that was just so fun to listen to. It reminds me that there is so much the, these people we interview, there's just so much that we don't know about folks even even folks that we know a lot about that comes up in these long form interviews. So it's just, it's really special. Scott's still involved in sports. He was doing sports radio and television for a while, and then he's still involved in sports. He's, he's been uh, a referee for basketball for a couple decades. And uh, I love what he said because I think there's just, there's a teaching lesson. There's a life lesson here, which is when a coach is angry with a call that he's made, and he has 10 seconds. He's kind of resolved himself to this this idea that whatever I say is not going to uh, make us agree here. Whatever I have 10 seconds to share with you is not going to, to, to appease you or make you calm right now. And so he does a little bit of active listening instead, which is, I think, a great technique. All right. So let's talk about Scott's relationship with Bill McKeechee because they talk about Bill quite a lot. Scott went to the University of Michigan. Bill McKeechee was Scott's dissertation chair. And it was the last time that Bill McKeechee served as a dissertation chair at the University of Michigan before he retired. So that's pretty special. There is some really insider uh, storytelling that happens here in in with regards to Bill McKeechee. You're going to love this. And and just reflecting as close as Scott was to Bill, you know, reflecting on what Bill gave to our discipline and to teaching of psychology in general was was really interesting for me to hear. There are priceless stories of Bill McKeechee's advice to Scott, like how to get athletes to attend class. It's just such a great story. Scott worked with Bill for two years and really learned from the best. I think we could all agree and uh, and held him in, in such high regard and uh, tells the story about his last visit with Bill before he passed away. You know, Bill McKeechee is not the only person that Scott has learned from. Uh, he also learned from, well, you might know him. Uh, his name is David Myers from Hope College, the author of introductory psychology textbooks that I think we all used. But yeah, so Scott took a, a, a psychology course from Dave Myers in the 80s and now works with Dave Myers at Hope College. And so just so much to get into here. If I haven't got you a little bit excited for this episode, then I'm doing something wrong because I took such joy in just listening to to uh, to Eric and Scott have these conversations uh, and tell these stories. Anyway, I'm going to leave it there. Enjoy this interview between Scott Vanderstoop and Eric Landrum. Welcome to another episode of Psych Sessions. I am so thrilled to be speaking today, and I, I hope I get this last name right. I, I, I say it two different ways about every other time. Dr. Scott Vanderstoop from Hope College. Scott, how are you doing, my friend? I'm doing great. I'm doing a lot better now that I'm hanging out with my uh, dear friend from the Mountain West. It's good to hear your voice, Eric. It's good to hear you too. First off, I want to thank you for making time today. Uh, I also want to thank you for forgive for forgiving me for my terrible scheduling abilities because we once tried to do this at the last uh, Midwestern Psychological Association meeting that we both attended. I I remember, and I um, I'm just glad. Oh. You can, sorry about that. That won't go off again. I remember and I missed it. And I'm glad that we have this makeup session. No, no, you didn't miss it. Um, I think you were right on time and right on the button. Um, I remember what happened. Um, We were set to do it. I invited you to come up to my room and I transposed the numbers. I transposed the numbers on my hotel room, and I did that to another guest as well. And um, we, I wasn't able to record that interview either. So I don't know what was you going on with that, me. That is all now. That is all coming back to me. It was, it was a retrieval failure, not an encoding failure. I do remember <laughs> I that. Oh, here we go. Oh, always the teacher. Oh, my God. Gosh, I'm glad to hear that. Is it the teacher coming out of the dean's voice or the dean's voice coming out of the teacher? What is it these days? Um, 
Well, I'm in my uh, I'm in my ninth year uh, serving uh, as the dean for social sciences at uh, the college I love, Hope College, which has been my uh, employment home since 1999, and also my alma mater. Uh, and there, I love almost everything about my administrative job. And the one thing I do not love about it is I just have far less student contact than I used to. I mean, I still teach most semesters, but um, you are now a department chair, so you probably realize that uh, being department chair didn't give you extra hours in the day or, you know, you might go on less sleep, but it's not like you are somehow can live on less sleep. And so it's a, um, I do, I miss teaching very much. And uh, I don't know where the rest of my career will take me, but if I ever leave this office and go back into teaching, I will miss much of what I'm doing, but I will, I will go back gladly to doing what uh, we all in psychological science, or at least most of us in psychological science, spent our early 20s and late 20s preparing to do. And um, so, yeah. Wow. So you, I, and Scott, I, I know you well enough to know that you're being genuine there. You have really found rewarding work in the dean's office. I have. And, you know, I, I, um, I don't, I'm sure there will be students and faculty who both listen to this and, you know, of the faculty, you know, m- Probably a lot of you have taken your turn as chair or program director, and I think there's something instinctual about uh, the socialization that happens in at least grad school that prepares you for the uh, professoriate, and that is this instinct to say, you know, administration, we don't really use the word evil, but it's to be avoided. If you have to do it, take your turn, do your fair share of complaining about it while you're there, and be grateful when you come back. And I, I don't refute that, and I, I certainly I, I think that's true for a lot of people. Um, but I also think, and I don't know if this is where we want to go for this particular segment. I you know, this is, and this is a lesson for anybody. You know, you have to have a degree of ambition to get where you want to be. And I know that when you're talking about sort of ambition for administration, that sounds you know maybe a little slimy to a traditional academic. But the truth is, if you walk into a position like even department chair and say, well, I don't really want to do it, I would respectfully suggest you might not do a very good job at it in the same, in any line of work. You, you have to have a certain ambition and a certain eagerness to do it. And that's why I applied, and that was why I was grateful to be uh, selected nine years ago and why I'm grateful to still be doing it. So, so are, are, there, are there terms at Hope College? How does that work? Do you serve at the pleasure of the provost? What's the... Serve at the, serve at the pleasure of the provost. Uh, we're, we are kind of in the process of implementing some term lengths, but they're not term limits. Um, I would say that, um, and again, I, we don't want to get too inside baseball here, Eric, but I, I think, and you, you probably can reflect on this as department chair, although I know you've only, I think you might, are you in year two? I, I am indeed. Wow. Great memory. Um, you know, I, I do think the, I think the shelf life of, uh, of academic administration is a noticeably uh, shrinking shelf life. And again, I don't want to get too inside baseball with this, but uh, partly because of uh, the fatigue that sets in, but also because of the fact that there are a lot of talented people who can do it. And uh, I think people ought to, ought to be given the opportunity to do that. So uh, I'm, I'm nowhere being done with my career at Hope College, but I also think, you know, I've been doing this for nine years and I think I've had some successes, but uh, you know, there there comes a point at which maybe it would be a good idea to, I believe it was Dr. Landrum who, uh, sitting at the Palmer House one evening when I first became uh, dean, you said to me, do you have retreat rights? And I didn't really, I didn't know the military military metaphor. And I said, what is, what is a retreat right? And you said, well, do you have the right to go back to the faculty? And uh, and I, it occurred to me, I never really looked at my appointment letter. So after I got back from Chicago, I went and I looked at and I do indeed uh, uh, retain my uh, tenured position. In, and, and that's, of course, pretty common, but uh, it, it never occurred to me. And uh, that's one of the reasons I like hanging out with you, because you see things that I don't see. Well, and, you know, I, I don't really want to, you know, argue with you off the top here, but I I'm not so sure that there's a lot of people out there who can operate at the dean's level well. 
um, you kind of said, well, there's a lot of people out there who can do this job and do it well. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not so sure that's true. I, you know, I think a lot of faculty members who aspire to and maybe eventually become a dean don't realize the difficulty of the job. Uh, I just, not only do I have a terrific dean here at Boise State, but actually, you know, in real time, a week ago, I interviewed her for the podcast, Dr. Leslie Durham. Um, and, you know, by being a chair, I've gotten to watch her do her job. I have, you know, kind of a a, a great view, so to speak, of the difficulties and challenges that she has to face. And it, first off, it's a job I don't ever want to have, but I, I think it's a really difficult job to do well. And I'm going to get to a point here eventually. I think to be a good dean, you cannot be conflict avoidant. Uh, you may not enjoy conflict, but you can't be conflict avoidant. And I think a lot of people who are faculty members who may think they want to be dean and may, might even get the job at first don't deal with conflict well. I believe I, I agree, and you are correct. I I would say it the following way that, I, and if if anyone ever asks <laughs> my advice on this, I would say if you and I'm not sure this is the sole purview of deanship or provosts or, you know, any kind of academic administration. But if you can do the hard work up front, I think you can avoid some, you know, some just some heartache and some difficulties uh, going forward. And I would say, for example, if you're a student who, you know, doesn't really want to do the research paper um, and you just kind of say, well, I just really don't, I'm not good at that. I don't like it. You can come up with six different things on your yellow pad. I, I still use yellow pads a little bit uh, that I'm going to do first and all of a sudden time gets away. I mean, if you can do the hard work up front and sometimes just getting the first few, you know, subtasks out of the way, all of a sudden you build a little confidence. You say, well, you know, I can do this. And that's true about, you know, uh, conflict. I think that's true about research. Probably true about starting your own podcast. If I could just get that first one done, the other ones would be hard. Well, but you know, the in part, yes, and sometimes when you start something brand new, you don't even know what's going to happen. So you're kind of ignorant uh, of how hard it's going to be. So you're just doing it, not knowing what's coming. I mean, that's the other side of that coin. My, uh, my appointment started on July first of let me think here 2012 and so i come swashbuckling into what i would argue is the second best office on hope's campus not through architectural design but probably by you know renovation mistake there you know my my office is big and it's uh beautiful and has wonderful i'm going to turn around here and look out it's a cloudy gross michigan february day but just a wonderful panoramic view like a 250 degree view probably of the campus and it was just because there wasn't a good way to split this office into two and i remember walking in thinking this is just such a great feeling and then a few hours later a dear friend of mine who actually still works in the division from a department not in psychology came in with some very complicated well thought out questions about kind of staffing and courses that he would like to try. And he was running kind of a, a starter program for us, uh, uh, just a, you know, just not a traditional academic department. And, and he spent about, I don't know, five, 10 minutes laying it out. And I listened to him and I said, uh, you know, these sound like terrific ideas, but there's something you need to know. He said, what's that? And I said, I don't know what the hell I'm doing because I'd been on the job all of like two years. Like I didn't know anything about, you know, how do we fund these classes? What are the sources of this? Is there a, you know, is there a donor for this? Do I have permission? So, you know, that's probably true of anyone when they start a first job. But the training, I think, going from professor to chair, from chair to dean, that, those are big, those are big steps. And, uh, and um, so, yeah, I think you're right. So, Scott, I, I'm going to switch gears on us a little bit. Uh, here's a game that I don't play well. And let's see if you're you're better at it. Uh, with rare exception, I cannot pinpoint the exact time and place where I have met someone. Do you, I, I have my best guess at where you and I met, 
But do, do you have any recollection of where we met? I do. Okay, and go for it. And I would love it. to share it with the audience. Sure, go for it. Um, I knew of you because of your work. And I don't remember if I was a grad student at the University of Illinois, where I spent two years and got a master's in social psych before transferring to the University of Michigan. But we were in Chicago. And uh, I had uh, I knew who you were. I recognized your face. And we both ended up at uh, we're going to date ourselves here. We both ended up at Toys R Us on Michigan Avenue, both oh shopping my for our young children. And so I saw you in the hall uh, in the aisle of this beautiful Toys R Us on Michigan, which is probably not there anymore. And I said, Eric, and you turned around kindly and said, yes. And I said, my name's Scott Vanderstoop, and I probably think it was at Michigan at the time. And I said, I, I'm, uh, uh, my name is Scott Vanderstoop. I'm a grad student at the University of Michigan. I may have even been a faculty member by then. I, I, and, uh, and you, uh, you reached out your, uh, your hand and you said, so nice to meet you. And we probably talked a little bit about Bill McEachie. And so I first yes. met you at the Toys R Us on Michigan Avenue. I, you know, you have reminded me of that now that I hear you say that. And yes, I would go there because I had to take something great home for the kids because you couldn't get that in Boise, Idaho. Of course. Yes. Yes. And, I, I met, I, and uh, yeah. if for those of you who want to read the Ion Psych High that's coming up, you can read the How I Met Mitch Handelsman story too. I, for some reason, I, I have she, I have sort of sketchy memories. I have I have bright spots and I have. Uh, dark spots but for some reason those sort of initial those initial encounters i happen to have a pretty good recollection for, well so. i figured logically it had to be at mpa midwestern psychological association for us what what do you remember when you were uh uh psychi midwestern vice president do you remember what years you were um, roughly should have had my vita pulled up i served no, four okay. years uh, and I do believe it was, um, I want to say it's 04 to 8, maybe 06 to 10. Okay. But the Toys R Us thing would have, been, would have been earlier. Well, we overlapped how long on council together? Two or three years? Well, I was only there two years. I was there uh, 09 to 11. Okay, well then I bet that's right. So if I was uh, Midwest V from oh four to eight, maybe oh five to nine, and then I spent three years in the president cycle, I bet that's when we overlapped. Because that would have brought me to about ten or eleven. Yeah. So um, because I, I would have fit, my my best guess would have been I would have met you at MPA as when you were VP because I was bringing students from Boise State out to the Palmer House and I um, do remember I, this was I think before I was VP but I remember you'd bring a boatload of students and I would I would and uh, and I kept thinking to myself I knew you had downstate Illinois roots but I kept thinking to myself boy that Landrum. He must have a gigantic travel budget. Here we are eating macaroni in our room, which we're cramming with five people, oftentimes not even at the Palmer House because it was less expensive. And he's flying in all these people from Boise. I was always uh, impressed. No, they and were always jealous. paying their own way. Well, no, they were. You brought a bunch of them. Yeah, you it, I mean, it, you know, it was a great experience for students, and for many of those students, which was just really special. For many of them, it was their first time out of Idaho, and sometimes it was their first time on an airplane. Wow, that's terrific! I mean, terrific. in college, I mean, it was just you know that research window, and and Psychi, of course, was just a great opportunity for them to participate. So, so, so I know I, that I'm not supposed, I'm not interviewing you, but you left. You kind of are, really. But go ahead. Well, no, you left. Did you leave? Carbondale and head right to Boise, or did you? Have no, a I had to stop, stop off, off a lovely stop off for three years. University of Wisconsin Platteville. Okay, so I was and in Platteville you, from uh, eight, eighty-nine to ninety-two. So that's how your your real your uh, your regional home was in Chicago for then for so many years. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I, I grew up in Northern Illinois, but and my grandparents were in Southern Illinois, and I went to SIU Carbondale, did my PhD there, so. Did you go to, oh no, oh, I'm going to get this wrong because I always mix up. It's okay. 
Uh, oh gosh, it's either. Uh, I am really happy to be a guest on Scott Vander Vander Stoop's podcast. Good afternoon, psychology fans. Scott Vander Stoop here interviewing Ari Landrum. Wow, Uh, listen to that voice for radio. Do you hear that? Yes, I have. uh, Well, wait, we'll get to that. But uh, so you went to Gales Galesburg? Did you go to? No. Oh my gosh! Yeah, I knew it. You're, you just mentioned the hometown of Knox College. Yes. The and rival of Monmouth College in Monmouth, right. Illinois. So don't tell a Monmouth person he went to Knox, and don't tell a Knox person he went to Monmouth unless you want yeah. to lose a friend. It's yeah. kind of like telling someone at the University of Michigan their colors are green and white. <clears throat> yes. Point well taken. Okay. Yeah. Next question. So so tell me about how you developed a voice for radio. I have a uh, I have a face for radio. I didn't say and that. A, and a voice for print and uh, <laughs> and a writing okay. style for TV or something. I don't know how it goes. No, I, I okay, by the way, folks, PD means professional development. All right. So um, just to make the, just for the record, uh, before we answer those emails, um, I did not say a face for radio, although I am aware of that joke. Yeah. Um, where did your radio uh, background come from? Oh, my God. Well, let's see. Um, we all went to college, if you're of a certain age, where the job board was literally three by five cards outside the career office. And so my friend, college roommate, and um, person who participated in my wedding, his daughter actually ended up going to Hope. She's, I mean, the, the, the legacy is long. She's getting her PhD in neuroscience at Michigan. So we've known each other since we were 18. And he said, hey, I was walking by the career office uh, and there was this little card. We were, uh, we were 19, so we were second years at uh, second uh, sophomores at Hope. And, and there was this uh, little country music station in Zeeland, Michigan, right down the road from Holland where Hope is. And um, they're looking for somebody to um, broadcast the, the, the local high school football games every Friday night. And I think he saw it like on a Thursday or Friday. We jotted down the information. I think we quick got, I think there might've been an application or maybe we just called. He called to interview us on a Tuesday is early September. We went in to see him at this little station. I mean, it's little, it's still standing. Um, They've got slightly different programming now, but we interviewed the guy on a Wednesday and he called on Thursday and said, all right, I'm going to hire you be at, um, be at the high school. I think it was a home game that way. Be at the high school um, tomorrow at six o'clock. The game's at seven. Now, I mean, I had listened to the radio, Eric, but the idea that I'm wearing a headset now, I, I mean, I didn't know what a headset was. I didn't know what a, I didn't know what a, like a, uh, uh, an antenna was. I didn't know anything. And I showed up at six o'clock an hour before and they said, all right, this is how you turn on the volume and this is how you um you it, we don't have the ability to listen to commercials but we run two 30 second commercials so as soon as you go to a break just do one mississippi two mississippi till you get to 60 oh my gosh and then say hey welcome back this is scott vander Stoop. <laughs> and so i did play by play uh high school football uh for three years and then joined the local radio state or joined the college radio station and got picked up by another am station that did local sports and did a little kind of local TV and things like that. Mostly, you know, it, I mean, it's wait, a little, wait, maybe, wait, wait, wait. maybe a, sl- a, a kick above like Wayne's world uh, for those of you of that generation. Wait, time out. All right. I'm calling time out here. So first off, so the radio gig comes to you in high school, not college. No, no. Sophomore in college to do high school football. So, so you I'm 19, are 19 okay and there I'm you are. yes I'm 19 and I'm announcing the game of a 17 year old with a coach who's probably in his late 20s or early 30s who's just like devastated like is this is this the guy they for and I want to say coach for $15 a game 1 5 you kind of get what you pay for <laughs> and in this and and this is college football this is like no, no, high school football? football, high school, high school football, football to start with. Then I later did do, uh, I did do local college football. Uh, I did, I did Hope College football later on. And uh, for those high school football games, how many people would be in the stands? 
Uh, oh, you know, it's it's not it's not Texas or Florida. I mean, it was it was just a regular old Friday night football game. You know, maybe couple a couple hundred or, or a couple thousand. No, no, no. I mean, it was they would fill up. It was let's see, nineteen eighties high school football. Yeah, I mean, the home crowd would be full, and the visitors probably not so many. I mean, it's not Odessa, Texas, but you know, football is kind of a kind of a thing around here. So, and um, so so ballpark it a couple thousand. Yeah, but remember, it's not public address to the stands here, Eric. It's actually on a local radio station. So, how many okay. people were listening on the radio? Okay, so it's well, not local. Know. There it's would not always local be address. several. There would always be. We'd get back to the radio, you know, station that night about I don't know ten or ten thirty. And there'd always be several people who called in. So that at least there were a few people who were complaining. They listened about how we pronounced the name or we didn't say this sure. particular, you know. Uh, and and you were on the AM side. Uh, that, was an, uh, that was an FM station, a country music station that, you know, just kind of had local coverage, Grand Rapids, uh, okay. Grand Rapids and Holland. <laughs> Will you do something for me? Will you do the call letter sign, please, for me? How Good evening. Used to? It, <laughs> Good evening. It is 8 o'clock, and you are listening to WZND 99.3 FM. This is Scott oh, Vanistoop there. along with Scott Gibson here coming to you from Zealand High School, where the Zealand High School Ducks are taking on the Four Seals Northern Huskies. Score 7 nothing. beginning of the third quarter. Zealand set to kick off. Oh Not more is to receive. Van Pelt to kick off, and we are underway with the second half. Oh my God! I haven't done that, by the way, in like four years. So no, that's not exactly true. I I will occasionally help out some of our live stream. I had a student a few years ago. We're here to talk about psychology, by the way. So this is the last uh, television no, radio story you, you get. But I had a student, uh, okay. Carly, uh, Carly Van Swall, who was a PE K, kind of a K twelve PE major, and she's just sort of an all all around sports junkie. And I saw her, my daughter used to play volleyball at Hope. And then the year after she graduated, I mean, we still go to all the matches and I saw her sitting over there doing our webcast, you know, our live stream and the game got over. And I was, I walked over to her as everyone's kind of leaving the gym. I said, Carly, you're sitting over there all by yourself. I said, that can't be easy to carry this, you know, for two hours all by yourself. She goes, Professor Vanderstoop, I can't find anyone to help me. And I said, Carly, I can help you. It's like, you don't have to be out there all by yourself. And so, I don't know, like a couple hours before the next match on a Wednesday, I got a text from Carly who said, hey, is there any chance you can come do, the, come do the match with me? So I've done some basketball and some soccer and volleyball along the way for us as well, but mostly to help the students because it's really, I mean, I like the students, to, and, but, but the broadcasting is fun. It's a fun little side hustle. And and you were on TV as well. You've mentioned when I was, I used to, uh, I would, um, you know, the television that I did was when we would go, when a team would go to a national, well, I did were two. One was just kind of the local cable station. We would run as a student, we would run a little 30 minute kind of hope college football digest show. So I would, um, the guy who really knew what he was doing would break down all the plays, put it into a 30 minute thing. And then I would wake up Saturday, no Sunday morning and, you know, try to pump myself full of coffee and, and just do sort of the voiceover of it. It was called, I think it was called hope football highlights. And, um, I actually think I have an old episode of that, that someone from the college archive sent me a few years ago that, uh, but yeah, that would, I would do that. Or sometimes when I worked for college relations uh, for the sports information director as a student back in the day, you would send like a 15 to 30 second audio feed to, Oh, even WGN WGN's program manager was a whole college grad. So he'd always want to run in his sports show, a little 30 second feed, uh, or you would hold the microphone while you would interview the coach and you would feed him the, you would feed him the questions. But, you know, I was, pro I was not always on television and they were just, yeah, uh, we're, we're spending, by the way, way too much time on this because it was, so, it's no, fun. But, <clears throat> no, I'm, I'm getting to something. So, but before I get there, that first, that first video appearance that, that Sunday morning gig, um, is that on YouTube anywhere? Oh, good heavens. I hope not. I think it might be on my computer, unfortunately, oh, you, uh, because somebody from the archive and there is hair 
There's hair beyond hair, 1985, curly blonde hair. Uh, I'm telling you, Scott, you let me know what kind of donation it would take to Hope College from me <laughs> to make that video go public. Oh, we can, yeah. We can talk about that off the air. That'd but be I, a great way. That'd be a great yep, way to. It sure yeah. would. <laughs> Next question. Yes, sir. Um, sports has really been an important. I think it continues to be really an important part of your life. What? Uh, I, and I know you played for a long time. And then I want you to talk a little bit about refereeing. But but what what have you played, and when when did that start? I um, I grew up playing sports like a lot of young people in America, and I was yeah I would say the sport I played the most was. Um, I played high school basketball, and I was I was proudly the eleventh man on a, a twelve person junior varsity basketball team at Hope College in what was that eighty three eighty four, and um, and uh, so yeah that was what I did I I always uh, I grew up in a little town called Ada Michigan and um, and in Ada they had you know in the forties fifties sixties both pre-World War II as post-World War II, all the way really up to, I stopped playing in probably about 05 or 08. But I used to go, when I was in grad school in Ann Arbor, um, my um, my dissertation advisor, whom you knew uh, very well, uh, Bill McKeechee, was a, a uh, decades-long fast-pitch softball player player and I love fast pitch softball I grew up watching but I never learned how to pitch and so among the many things Bill McKeechee taught me to do is he taught me to throw fast pitch softball which is the purview of it's a women's sport now there are very few men who play it but it was a men's sport you know certainly in the middle of last century from oh 1940 to well, I mean, it still exists. There's just very few people who play it. And I did that. Um, and that was just kind of a fun stress reliever for me. I'd just grab a few softballs and throw up against a fence somewhere at a local Ann Arbor park because <laughs> it was just a good way to get rid of get rid of the dissertation blues. And that's what, um, you know, we can talk a little later about Bill McKeechee. But yeah, that's uh, that's what I did as, a, as an adult from probably from the time I was 25 till the time I was probably 45. And then basketball officiating, I have been doing either high school or college basketball officiating uh, since I returned to Michigan in 1996. And um, I did, I never got beyond Division III, uh, for those of you who know, or some of you might recognize, depending on the part of the world you live in, NAIA basketball. I think everyone who ever officiated basketball has dreams of being one of those people who shows up on ESPN every night and makes obscene amounts of, obscene amounts of money for two hours worth of work. But it turns out, you know, there are only about 40 or 60 of those people around. And so, um, yeah, that's that's been a big part of my life. I'm not doing it this year uh, just because uh, the season kind of started late here. But I've, I've been uh, I really enjoy that. It's a fun way to spend a Friday evening. Uh, it's, I find it stress relieving, actually. It's just I don't mind getting yelled at by coaches. I don't mind getting yelled at by fans. It's just a nice way for me to kind of forget about life for a while and uh, spend a couple hours on a Friday night officiating a basketball game. So, And and I, I would have never have known that, except I think in the past, you have occasionally posted pictures on Facebook of you in the midst of refereeing situations. It was fun. One of my... Um, one of one of the one of the more uh, one of the uh, more enjoyable experiences I was, um, uh, and I know you want to talk about Mikichi as do I, but I was I ran in 2006. I ran for Michigan State Senate, and I was um, I was really spending kind of all of my time that I wasn't working, you know, campaigning, walking door to door, trying to raise money. I, I suffered ignominious defeat, but I remember driving back from Kalamazoo, Michigan. And um, and my phone rang and it was a debate in Kalamazoo, a live television debate with my opponent uh, who vanquished me several weeks later. And it was a friend of mine from Detroit whom I had officiated college basketball with. And I still remember his name. Uh, well, I mean, I still know him. I, he doesn't. I think he's now retired from officiating, but he's just a dear friend. And the phone rang and I saw it was a Detroit area coach. So I picked it up and he said, Scott, it's Wallace. I said, how are you, Wallace? What can I do for you? And he said, well, what are you doing Saturday? And I said, well, if it's anything like the last few Saturdays, I'm going to be, you know, walking up and down the streets of Georgetown Township, Michigan, trying to convince people to vote for me. He goes, oh, shoot. I said, why? What's going on? He goes, well, 
I kind of need some help uh, officiating this scrimmage on Saturday. It was like the middle of October. And I said, well, yeah, I probably shouldn't do it. What did you have in mind? What do you need? He goes, well, I got a call from the University of Michigan, and they need someone to uh, officiate their intra-squad scrimmage at 3 o'clock at the Chrysler Center, and they're playing Penn State in football at noon, and so they're just going to invite everybody from the football game over to fill up Chrysler. So there'll be like 15,000 people there. I said, oh. I said, well, in that case, Wallace, I'll skip campaigning for the day, and I'll I'll be there in Ann Arbor. You tell Coach Amaker I'll, I'll be there. And so I got to officiate it uh, at the Chrysler Center in front of about 15,000 people in a very low risk environment because they were all, it was just Michigan playing Michigan. So that was kind of, and I, you know, that was kind of the most fun I've ever had. I, you know, sort of got to imagine that I could actually be one of those guys you see on ESPN every day. Well, and I mean, obviously, Scott, of course you could be one of those guys because you were doing the same tasks that they do. Right. But just like, People who work for Amazon think, well, I could be CEO. <laughs> no, <laughs> you know, it's they, not. They don't need that many. It's just, it's kind of a numbers game. It, it's you know? not the it's same thing, like, and you know it. Well, but think about how many applications are you going to get for your uh, for any openings you might have this year in the psych department? You'll probably right. get fifty, won't but, you? But the but the the referee on the court of a basketball game of a Division three competition is do, performing the same tasks as the referee on the court of a division one basketball game. Yes. And us, uh, we division three officials used to talk about that a lot. <laughs> yeah, I bet. And, and that's absolutely so I, true. I, I have to ask the, the obvious question. Uh, are, are there parallels between being a basketball referee and a college Dean? Um. I have thought about that. I don't know if um, I can articulate a succinct answer. I think that uh, being a basketball referee involves listening. It, I, I tell young basketball officials um, that there are a couple of axiomatic principles I think that will get you, that will let you have fun doing it and that will keep you out of trouble. Uh, number one, um, you don't always have to be right. And number two, you don't always have to get in the last word. And I see a lot of young officials just have to say, yes, but coach, this is why I called it the way I called it. And, you know, in the 10 seconds that you have to discuss that with a coach before you move on to the next play and run down the court, there's very, it's, it's, in some ways, it's sort of like running for public office. There's very little I can say in 10 seconds that's going to convince you uh, that you're wrong and I'm right. And I think oftentimes if I just listen and sometimes I'll say things like, you know, coach, did you see it a little differently than I did? And then they'll say, yeah, of course I did. Vanderstoop, what are you talking about? It was clearly, you know, the opposite of what I just thought it was. And, you know, we don't, we don't get a lot of upset people in our offices, but I, I do find that if I ask people, you know, what, what's it been like for you? Or, uh, did you see that situation differently than I did? Those are some of the tools that I've used both as a dean and as a uh, and as a basketball official. And I would say, Scott, that those two those two axioms, those two pieces of advice, are very good pieces of advice for faculty members, not new faculty members, but for all faculty members. I just think for faculty members, uh, most of them, most faculty members have a difficult time following those pieces of advice. Yes. And myself included. But I think when we're at our best, it just allows us to help, you know, I don't want to sound too, you know, too much like Carl Rogers here. I'm not a clinician, but just to help, just to help us understand what it's like to be somebody else, I think is, uh, can go a long way in lots of walks of life. You are correct. So we've mentioned this fellow a couple times, Bill McKeechee from the University of Michigan. And um, I, I did have an honor and a privilege to get to know him a little bit throughout his career and interview him. And um, but you you had a far greater honor. Would would you mind telling our listeners about um, your experiences and your training with Bill? Sure. Uh, well, his his was a name, uh, Bill McKeechee, uh, that I recognized uh, as as I was moving from Illinois to um, Ann Arbor. 
And I, it was one of those that I had sort of read along the way as an undergrad and the first two years of grad school, but I, I just, I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't sort of dialed into the teaching of psych yet. And I hadn't really thought about it, you know, where I was just kind of doing other things within psychological science. And so my first experience with them was during year one, I think we were all uh, on an RA of some kind, research assistantship. And then I think that was winding up. So at the end of year one in Ann Arbor, I, um, I submitted, like a lot of grad students at Michigan who weren't on fellowship, you know, what is it you want to do? And I saw this thing called Psych 100, Learning to Learn. And um, I saw Makichi was the professor. And um, so I submitted my application and he and he called me and he said, hey, I just got your application, just doing some interviews. And um, did you know, he said that I have an honorary degree from Hope College. And of course, if I had been about myself, I would have said, yeah, I knew that. But of course, I didn't. And I'm not going to lie to him. I said, no, that's so cool. He goes, yeah, they gave it to me. And I want to say it was in the 70s. And um, he said, we've had some Hope people come here and I've been to Hope to speak. And, you know, and it was a really pleasant conversation. And then he called back the next day. And I think, think it's the power of the network. And the, yeah, I'd like to think it was because I had a great interview with him over the phone, but it was probably not. And he just said, yeah, I decided to go with you. I'd like you to be my TA for Psych 100, which at Michigan was called Learning to Learn. Most places, that's the intro. But at, I think at, at Michigan, the intro was, I think, Psych 171. So um, I got to I got to spend two years serving as, as his teaching assistant, and it was formative in so many ways. I mean, he was truly for for folks who recognize the name and didn't know it. I mean, he was truly the master of everything about the teaching of psych, and he was the things that we now sort of take for granted about oh everything from discussion to learning objectives to access to fair you know all of the things that we talk about now that probably most of us know in psychology and even in other academic disciplines i don't want to say he invented it but he was just so far ahead of his time truly a pioneer and really i would say to this day the most recognized uh and sort of uh recognized luminary uh, for those of us who take teaching of psych as a uh, as a uh, as a craft. And I just feel honored beyond uh, really what I'm able to articulate that I got to spend the time that I did with him. So I, and I will just say one other thing that yeah. I was I had the I had the good fortune of being his last. Now, of course, like a lot of professors, like he says he's going to retire and he was going to retire at age 70. And of course, he kept doing it, but he couldn't be depart. He couldn't be dissertation chair beyond sort of the full retirement. And so I was in his last year and I was his very last uh, PhD student. And I remember he walked out of the dissertation room. And for those of you who have had dissertations, Eric, you know, that sort of daunting feeling while you wait outside for the pronouncement from the committee. Congratulations, Dr. Landrum. And he walked out and he got choked up and he gave me a handshake and he said, congratulations, Dr. Vanderstoop. And um, I think I knew I knew the importance of that in my life. But I think he recognized that, you know, this is the last person who I for whom I will serve as dissertation chair. And that's beyond really uh, what I could um, what I could ever hope for. And then I promise you that would be the last point. But just to kind of put a dot on that eye, uh, just a few days before he passed at the age of 97, two summers ago, I had heard that he, you know, that he was fading and he had lost his wife and um, his memory. He was in pretty severe cognitive decline. And I happened to call his phone number. Um, that I was able to get from another uh, faculty member at Michigan. And he answered the phone <laughs> the same way he did 30 years ago. He'd always say, McKeechee's. So he'd answer, McKeechee's, and who's in his assisted living room. And, and he said, oh, hi, Scott, how are you? And I went to see him the next day. I told him I was going to come to see him. And I really didn't know if he would remember. And uh, so I'm kind of wandering around this gigantic place. And somebody, one of the workers said, are you looking for Bill? I said, I am. He goes, he told me he was expecting somebody. And he kind of points me down the hall. And he was sitting outside. And, and you know, there was the facial recognition. And you could see his eyes light up. So there was an implicit memory there. And I walked up to him. And I said, hello, Bill. And he said, hi. And I said, do you remember me? And he goes, no, sorry. And I had just talked to him the day before. So I knew his explicit memory was pretty deteriorated at that point. I said, my name is Scott Vanderstoop. I work at Hope College. He looked, perks his, his eyes up and goes, Scott, 
you were my last PhD. And wow. it was just so cool that he had that implicit memory of, of who I was and, and what, uh, what he meant to me and what I, what I hope I meant to him as his last PhD. He had trouble with real explicit recall at that point. But the fact that that was like the last thing he said to me, that's just, that'll be with me forever. Yeah. Yeah, he he is and was a remarkable human being. And, you know, you were talking about how he probably invented a lot of, you know, of the teaching and learning techniques that we use today. And I think you're exactly right. He, I think he did. And, and remarkably, he, he published on a lot of that stuff, um, well before there was this thing called SOTL, you know, there, you know, um, a, a couple things lead me to those conclusions. One is, um, I, I had a couple chances to interview Bill um, in uh, one in the 1990s and one in the 2000s for book chapters. So I did a little bit of research on him and read some of his work. And then um, I had a chance to speak at his memorial um, after he passed away. I and remember. so I did, I, I did more research and um, before that uh, event and I, I dug deeper than I ever had before. And, you know, he would publish things where, you know, he did experiment, literally experiments in his learning to learn classroom um, about teaching techniques. And, and like you, like you said, developing discussion techniques. I, I'm trying to remember one of them. It was, uh, it was like six by six or a six pack where, he would have students in a group of six work for six minutes, and he would run up and down the aisles in this classroom and facilitate these discussions. And he he published about that, and he published and he collected data about the the discussions they were having and student reactions to it and student satisfaction. And he he was an he was an innovator well before most people were either talking about it or publishing. And I, I believe he was the first person in the state of Michigan to broadcast um, teaching, college-level teaching in the state of Michigan. Uh, my memory for that is not as clear, but that does, yes, I, that does sound vaguely familiar. But those those kinds of things he studied in the 70s and the 80s sort of became kind of the industry standard, at least in the classes he taught. So, you know, we would do those six pack discussions or we would do this and we'd have the TA meeting and he'd say, okay, this is what we're going to do this week. And of course I didn't know the literature the way maybe I should have, but I was, I was pretty new at it. And, and, uh, and yeah, to this day, I think about all of the things that, uh, that we all now take for granted about how to handle student anxiety and how to handle conflict and how to handle, you know, how to go over tough tough uh, discussion topics in class and what makes for a good lecture and, you know, when, how long should the lecture be? Like, that's one of them. Like, don't make your lecture too long. <laughs> he always said, and he would give us feedback. So we'd all gather around and we'd all take turns given, you know, we'd have our group of 25 and then we'd all have a few chances during the semester where we could speak to the group of a hundred. We'd all, we'd all gather together afterwards to debrief and critique and you go, okay, what'd you think of Scott's lecture today? And the TAs would chime in and he'd <laughs> most of the time he'd say, you all talk too long. <laughs> they don't, you know, they, that is not how you're going to get active learning. They don't want to sit there and listen to you for 50 minutes. You got to figure out other things to engage them. Get, we need more cognitive engagement. Oh my gosh. And the, the thing I learned really, and I know obviously you were there too. I'm, I'm just kind of telling the audience that for, for his memorial, what I learned is that he just, he wasn't all about his academic job or his position. It really seemed like he had a rich, fulfilling family life. I mean, you talked about his involvement with sports and, you know, we got to hear from his, his daughter and his granddaughter. And we heard stories about him taking to the time to really sit with faculty members and he was active on campus. And, and it, it just, it, it really sounded like he was well-rounded. Yeah, he was. I remember seeing him, believe it or not, I want to say it was AERA, American Educational Research Association in Chicago. It might have been APA. And I showed up at, 
that later that evening because I had something and and he he and Jenny probably took the train because the, you know they just always they just always took the most modest way to travel and uh, so we showed up and I remember that um, I was having trouble with a couple of um, a couple of uh, athletes in my class they weren't showing up and they weren't performing and I said I just I don't I don't know how to handle this and he said well I'll just call Jack Weidenbach on Monday. And it was like a Saturday night. And Jack Weidenbach at the time was the athletic director at Michigan. I said, y- you're going to, you're going to do what? <laughs> he goes, well, these kids need to get to class. He said, uh, I can't think of a better way to get them to class than to call the athletic director and they'll call the coach and they'll be in class on Monday. <laughs> and that's, I said, Oh, isn't that kind of bringing a fire extinguisher to a match fire? Are you sure that's a good idea? He says, no, this is what we're doing. And uh, sure enough, those students were there promptly and sincerely on Monday morning or Monday afternoon. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll 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 just tell one more Bill McKeechyism. Uh, Jane Hallinan and I flew out a day early before his memorial, and we went through the University of Michigan archives on Bill. And Bill, thankfully, archived so many things. And as we went through them that day. Um, w- uh, there was a whole folder of memos between him and athletic directors at Michigan, as well as coaches, like you just said. And one was, and I'm going to forget the name, but to a very famous coach and copied CC to the athletic director saying, um, although we have a really fine basketball team this year, they're traveling too much. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're, they're out of the classroom way too much. They're missing way too many classes. Can you please look at their schedule and try to do something where they're not leaving so many days ahead of their scheduled games so they can be in the classroom more? I mean, outstanding. he was really all about the learning and he didn't, he, he was fine. You know, sending memos to uh, regents, to the president, to the, you know, nationally famous coaches uh, didn't bother him at all. Yeah. Yeah. Most influential person in my professional career. I mean, yeah. with, with uh, without doubt. So and thanks so, for asking about that. Of course. And Scott, you know, w- one of the things that I've come to know about you as well is that you've always struck me as someone who's also been very balanced. And and I really get the sense from you in our interactions that that family has really always been an important part of your life and balance. And I, I've heard you, and, and we don't have to go too far here. We don't, I don't want to cross any boundaries, but I, you have, you have three kids, correct? I do. And twins. And what, do. can you, you can tell me, uh, just a, I know family has been so important to you. Tell me a little bit about family, if you don't mind. Sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm uh, you don't have to, uh, you don't have to ask me too, uh, too aggressively for that. I have a 27 year old uh, daughter and uh, she is in med school at uh, Michigan State University. So a couple of Wolverines raised a Spartan, apparently, for those of you who know our region. Um, and uh, she's actually taking a year off from med school to get a master's in public health. Imagine that getting a master's in public health in the year of a pandemic. But she's at Johns Hopkins University doing a one-year MPH and will return for year four of medical school uh, in May. And then I do have twins. They are 23. Uh, my daughter is a uh, grad student in engineering in Ann Arbor. So we did raise another Wolverine. And my son uh, is a uh, has passed his uh, CPA exam and uh, works for an accounting firm in Grand Rapids right down the road. So we are all very proud of I I spoke in our, uh, for those of you who know, who know Hope, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a faith-based institution. So I was speaking in chapel, oh, I don't know, maybe four or five years ago. And I said, my name is Scott Vanderstoop. I'm a dean. Most of you don't know the dean. I said, and I'm, I'm the second best professor in my family, and I'm the fifth best known Vanderstoop on this campus because my oldest daughter was on our volleyball team when, he won, when it won its Division Three National Championship. My son was on the tennis team and my daughter was on the track team and they were involved in all kinds of things. And my wife, who uh, is an outstanding statistics professor and co-author of uh, several statistics textbooks, uh, way more people know her around campus. So I, uh, I, I, I proudly say I'm the second best professor in my family and the fifth, well, the fifth best known on Hope's campus. So, yes, we are very much a Hope family and it's been it's it's been a terrific place for for all five of us. 
is that so so this uh and this has been an enduring trait demonstrated throughout this chat this um self denigration this modesty is that a midwestern gig is that a f- how you were raised in your family uh it is it's it's the real you by the way for our audience i've obviously known scott 20 25 years but is that is that just you don't want to brag about anything you want to deflect attention uh, it's a fair question, and I think it's a question that deserves some self-reflection on my part because I do think, I, I, in my on my best days, I'd like to say that this is who I am, and um, that uh, I, I I do I I I don't like. I, I know how do I say this? I, I'm not somebody who I, I would say I neither seek the spotlight nor uh, shun the spotlight, but I do think that. I, what I think I'm good at is I think I'm pretty good at sort of having a high degree of self of, I don't know if this, you can help me if this is an actual term, maybe this could be a project of sort of normative self-awareness, not just how I appear to others. I think I'm good at that, but I also really think I'm a pretty good judge of talent and skill and performance. And I mean, Eric, you work at a big university, you look around, it's like there are a lot of smart people around here. And there are a lot of people who do a lot of good things. And uh, so, yes, it's a combination of you know, sort of regional acculturation. You grew up in downstate Illinois, uh, or you spent some time down there. You know that bragging is kind of not part of the gig. But I also think that if you really know yourself, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm getting a little hoarse here. If you really know yourself, you have to come to the conclusion there's just a lot of very hardworking and talented people out there. And the best way to sort of embrace that is to say, I want to hang out with those hardworking and talented right. people, and I want to be more like them. So right. you're very kind to say that. Well, and I think the thing that, you know, the the privilege that I've had in being part of Psych Sessions is that I've gotten to talk to so many outstanding people. And a, as a general rule, academics suck at taking a compliment uh, for a, a myriad of reasons. Uh, and, you know, part of it is not wanting to seem braggadocious. Part of it could be imposter syndrome. And, I, and I've mentioned this on other podcasts and other interviews. And, and it's, um, I don't know, I, I don't think it's a problem or an issue. It's just, um, it, it I, I, I guess it, it, I think it boils down to this. I wish sometimes that people could see themselves the way the world sees them um, because they would realize how awesome they are the way I think how awesome they are. Um, that's all. So I, and Scott, actually that, that, that's going to, that's going to take me into uh, one of my favorite memories of you that I want to mention as, uh, as we're coming up on an hour. And I know I've taken some time of yours today, which I've really enjoyed. One of my, one of my favorite memories of you that, that kind of made me sit up and pop and pay attention. And I don't even know if y'all remember this. Uh, it was during your three-part presidential term at Psychi, and for for listeners, you know, like a lot of organizations, when you become president of something, it's a three-part gig. It's president-elect, president, and past president. And I'm not really quite sure when this happened. And by the way, this is a good thing. I'm not going to embarrass you. Um, when this happened, I don't know where you were in that three-part gig, but we were at a Psychi board of directors meeting, and. Um, we, you, the discussion, I was a, vi- a vice president for the Rocky Mountain region. I was a newbie on the board. And uh, there was a discussion about kind of reframing the role of the executive director and kind of, it was an exciting time where that was kind of being re-envisioned. And I think the people in the room and the board members were having a hard time kind of thinking big, you know, we kind of thought about how it had always been thought about. And I, I remember we were sitting around this, this big table in some place, I can't even remember where, and, and you stood up and you were talking about this for a while. And I remember this distinctly. You said, this is a real, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, this is a real time 
to be innovative. This is a time where, you know, we could give the executive director a chance to think big and boldly. Um, think about if you had the opportunity to not only do one sabbatical project, but what if you could have three sabbatical projects at the same time? But instead of like at a university, you had the financial support to do three sabbatical projects. What would you do and how would you dream about that? I don't know if you remember that, but I sat up in my chair and I kept my mouth shut and I went, oh my God, look at that. That is awesome. Is that what Psychi is going to be about? Is that what this guy is about? Holy, well, I can't say what I would said, but to myself, but it was like, all right. Um, I do remember. Uh, I do remember that. I um, I think you may have uh, flattered me a little bit, but I I do think you're right that it was it was a fun time. And we don't get a lot of opportunities in higher ed to think about those kinds of things because there are constraints. You know, you, I'm sure you have great ideas about the psych department at Boise, and I have great ideas about the social science division at Hope, and, and those are fun to dream about. But there are barriers, and, and sometimes uh, it's, it's, it's a unique opportunity to think about those, to reimagine an organization in the absence of some of the personnel or uh, you know, financial barriers that so many organizations face. So, yes, thank you for remembering that, perhaps a little more flatteringly than I deserve. Uh, I, again, uh, uh, see previous discussion topic. <laughs> you know, is that imminent or opposite? I can't see, remember. See Appendix A again. <laughs> Yes. Uh, Scott, I, I know I've taken up ab about an hour's time and I've thoroughly enjoyed this, but I, I kind of want to finish off on coming back to the role of a dean. Is is there anything, I, I, I guess I want to ask a couple things. Is there anything that you wanted to mention, but is there anything that you wish faculty knew about it that they don't know? Or is there any great misunderstanding that, gosh, I just wish people knew this, or the most under the most misunderstood thing about my job is X. Um, if, if you had a chance to clear the air or to broadcast something, what, what might that be? Um, my uh, dear friend who sits as our dean of libraries, who also sits on what we call our dean's council. The, um, uh, the It's our academic cabinet. Uh, so, And we were talking about books one time, and I think we must have been having lunch with maybe some guests, or I, I can't remember. And she just very sort of politely let firmly say, uh, she politely yet firmly said, um, I need to, I need to clear up one myth. Uh, and that myth is that librarians have time to read. She said, I'm running a library. I don't sit around as much as I'd like to and read 12 hours a day. Uh, and I guess maybe the rough analog to that uh, here would be that, um, you know, as much as I would like to be out, um, you know, raising money or uh, imagining new buildings or building new curricula or, you know, getting a new uh, football stadium built. Um, the truth is that, you know, in the same way that uh, everyone's job has a, has a grind to it, there there is just work to do. So a typical day for me is, you know, before I hopped on with you, Eric, I'm, I'm writing a proposal to uh, the president and, um, and uh, some other people on the uh, on the vice president's group, and I'm I'm just making a pitch for for another thing that we that we need here, and I'm trying to figure out how I can make the money work. And you know, there are tenure letters and third year review letters and opportunities to meet with faculty. It's a wonderful, wonderful job. But you know, although the 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 view is beautiful from my office, the truth is it's it's work. And um, you know, if you think about sometimes work isn't romantic. It isn't as though we sit around and, and read great things and have these wonderful ideas. I mean, uh, there's, there's, there's just action. It's got to be, 
you know, I, I don't I don't want to I don't want to be political here by any means. But, you know, uh, President Biden strikes me as a worker. Like, I don't think he's particularly flashy, um, but I suspect he kind of gets up and goes to work. And whether you're talking about the president of the United States or an assistant professor of um, psychology, they just I think you get up and you do your work. And you try to make, uh, you try to get a little bit better every day. Our football coach here on campus says that if a team can get one percent better every day, they'll be really good by the end of the season. So, I, I sort of am adopting that. If you can just get a little bit better every day, and you can make a little bit of a difference every day, then over the course of, you know, many years serving, you'll make an impact, and that that can be a legacy kind of impact. Dave Myers, uh, whom you know, who also uh, works here at Hope College, says. You know, you're not going to wake up one morning and write an intro psych book. You're going to write two and a half pages of an intro psych book every day. And after a year and a half, you're going to have a 500 page book. So get after it. I guess the same is true for me. I mean, does he really work there or does he just kind of, you know, stop in every once in a while? No, you know? he's probably in, the in middle his office. Of his book tour. No, he, you know, obviously. Uh, when you're on version, you know, 11, edition 11 or 12, it's got to be easier on edition 11 than it was edition one. But uh, yeah, he probably more than anyone in the, you know, even in the pandemic, he's into work every day. That's where all of his stuff is. It's where his monitors are. It's where he's comfortable. So when I cross the courtyard and walk over into the psych building, I can almost rest assured that I can be most confident that Dave Myers will be there. Whereas some of us might be teaching or working from home. Uh, he is there and uh, and still continues to bring the energy and joy uh, with him to that work that uh, he did when I knew him as a student in 1983. Oh, my gosh. Isn't that great? He, 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 he's really still there. I mean, I mean, I know he lives in Seattle, and I know he's still listed as a Hope College faculty member. He does spend some time in Seattle. Uh, he does spend some time across the pond, um, and they have uh, places that they're able to. Uh, but but he, well, no matter where he is, he's working. But you know, most right. Of his oh, time absolutely is that. Yeah. Right here in Holland, Michigan, right in that little nine by nine office that he's had since that building opened in whatever year it opened. <laughs> so. Oh my gosh. That's that is fantastic, I Scott. I, I I know I keep saying I want to wrap it up, but I actually I really don't want to wrap it up. But I know we should. Um, we just uh, we've had great fun um, with a start and a stop in it, uh, writing for Psychi together, and uh, we just sent a fond farewell to Mitch Handelsman, which you mentioned. Oh, I don't know, about an hour ago. Uh, that's been a joy, hasn't it? It really has. That's um, it. It uh, the, I've liked everything about it. It's uh, yeah, not much to say other than that was just great, great fun. Yeah, I, I this I, I guess this is a story I get to tell about you and about Mitch. Um, I was giving a talk. I'm going to say it was like APA Toronto uh, one year, and you and Mitch were in the audience, and um, I. It was about, I don't know, about going to grad school. And I was on the panel with someone else who I'm not going to name. And um, the presentation didn't go so well. And uh, you guys caught me out in the hallway and, and said some very kind things. And we and that's where the brainstorming of, well, you know, it'd be, it'd be better. I had said something that Mitch corrected. And he was right, of course. And... <laughs> And we started talking about, well, you know, three heads would be better than one. And and that's when we started writing that together. Then we stopped for a while, and then we got asked to restart it. And now uh, Mitch has just rotated off, and we had a really good time saying goodbye to him. Yes, it was um, – that was – that was. I, I think that I, I got – comments from even students here on Hope's campus, you know, hey, Professor Vanderstoop, I just picked up the the magazine on the on the counter. And I I didn't know that you did that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that. So I mean if it's happening at a little old Hope College, I'm assuming people are picking that up and reading it online. And uh so I hope I, I mean not only was it fun, but I, I do think that if I, I I kept imagining like what kind of stuff would I want to know if I'm twenty one years old. And um uh, 
and and wanted to to have a career in you know either the helping professions or a career in psychological science and to and to move beyond the bachelor's uh, degree. So yeah. Well, and Scott, you had and you've given an amazing career of help and helping profession advice to others. And I just want to take a moment to thank you for your time and and very sincerely thank you for your friendship. It has been amazing, and I hope it continues to be that way, my friend. Uh, the feeling is very mutual, and uh, I can't wait for uh, the next project because uh, I think I said earlier, I know I said earlier that the best way to 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 take advantage, you, you absolutely have to take advantage of the uh, ingenuity and the hard work and the uh, and the intelligence that's around you. So I have a feeling a new Landrum project is right around the corner. And uh, you score very high on creativity. And you, um, we've done a few things together. We've had, I think we got rejected by APA books a few years ago. But I just got this feeling that something's coming from you in the next 12 months. Well, just a prediction. Uh, I'm going to do my best to take that compliment and not uh, reject it or deflect it. So thank you, my friend. And thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Eric. Thank everyone. Thanks to everyone for uh, sticking with us. This was great fun. Thank you. Mm-hmm.